Cool. All right, so this um, is an example of the ceramicist. Um, she made this blog post from Fran describing her explorations with Renway ML. Um, but basically, she had a lot of photos of her own ceramics and went ahead and fed those into a model that she trained within Renway ML and then used that to generate new uh, new ceramics that are based off of her work, but are a little like weird and distorted. And then she went um, another step on top of that where she actually picked a couple of those and then made them um, like physically with ceramics afterwards. And yeah, I really like uh, work that like goes through generations and then comes back to like something tangible in the real world. Um, Next is this work by Janelle Shane. Play. Ah. Derek, could you chime in a little bit about this? I remember it's about um, Spade. Yeah, so what this is doing, and we'll talk about this a little bit uh, this week actually, is so this is taking um, a Star Wars film um, I don't know which one, because uh, there's millions of them now. Um, deconstructing the images into image segments and then using those image segments to uh, be put into Spade, which is a model that takes image segments and then converts them into imagery. So we'll talk more about image segments uh, today. Um, this is a work by Fabin Rashid. He took, um, there's this model within Runway that allows you to sort of draw these image segmentation blobs, like here, this big blue blob um, right here. Um, and then each of those colored blobs uh, corresponds to a specific texture or like, uh, like mountains or river. And what he did was he actually, I think, plugged this into a P5JS app that he wrote so that he could actually um, use it with his tablet to draw things and render things. So yeah, this is an example of runway integrating with uh, something external. Adam Picard, he was in one of our classes. He's a, a 3D graphics animator and yeah, um, trained a model on, um, uh, trained a model on images he had of um, stained glass windows, but then actually with the latent walk video that was morphing between different frames, he brought that into a 3D modeling software um, and actually shown light through it. Um, Andreas Rechgaard, I, I think this was, um, Derek, do you remember what this was? Yeah, so Andreas trained this on a bunch of historical images, like tin types, and then he also used a model called Deoldify, which converts black and white images to color. Um, what I think is really interesting here is you have this, like, very good, um, like it's like a very clear sort of, it's very clear shapes, but then there's like weird stuff going on as well. So I think it's an interesting case of where like, um, you know, we won't talk a little too much about training in this, in this course, but um, in this case, it's one where like, he had a small amount of samples, I think, and it still turned out fairly interesting. So, um, yeah. Um, this was another one of our students, Nai. He, is an animator as well and filmmaker. And he wanted to incorporate uh, machine learning into like in incorporate both of them together. Um, each of these you can see in the beginning is attention GAN. Here he's taken um, this Beyonce music video for all the single ladies and um, then PoseNet on top of it and DensePose. Um, 
later on, he also um, he also incorporates a a first order motion model, like getting some lip syncing going on, and yeah, right here. And this is another face tracking thing that's it within Runway. And at the very end, um, it's pretty good because he lists, oh, this is an example of a style transfer. And at the very end, he sort of lists all the different models he used within Runway. So it's, I think it's like a pretty generally good resource um, that covers like a lot of different models within Runway. Jason Powers, he, uh, he was really interested in type. Um, he had a lot of pictures that he had taken of um, sort of grungy typography that he found, like uh, dilapidated street signs and storefronts. And within Runway, he um, trained a model which produced these sort of distorted type forms. Um, here what's going on is you can actually see there is an, there's one image that the model produced, like here there's this big S. There's this big S which is static and then behind it he's also um, sort of underlaid a latent walk interpolation space. Yes, this is an example of where he wasn't actually really very happy with what the style gam model ended up producing, but he found a way to use it as a material to keep doing other things with it. So, you know, sometimes it's, you got to make lemonade out of, or lemon from, lemonade from lemons, is that how it works? Yeah, whatever. Um, so I think he found a way to still make some interesting textures, uh, even if the model didn't work the way he expected it to. April, um, she had a, she had like a series of sketchbooks that she would draw in every time she traveled somewhere new. Um, so she would, um, like she had like about 400 or so images of uh, her sketchbook and like that particular location in the background. And she trained a model within Runway on that. Um, and these were some of the outputs. Um, these are like generated sketches of this also like fake generated landscape behind it in the background. And so this was a really interesting case where um, she had all of these sketches and also um, within the image, like the sketch of the place and then the actual photo of the place in the background. And it kind of like does replicate it pretty, like better than I would expect. Um, later on, she actually put this, put the drawings into a plotter and drew it or had a plotter actually draw it with different, um, different materials like ink and watercolor. And for her, she said that it was um, a really interesting exercise because for her, each of these drawings might take like hours on end and then this plotter could just produce it within a couple of minutes. So um, yeah, the reason why we are showing you all of these different, uh, different inspirations is um, we really want you guys to think about um, in terms of data sets, you should think about like, what do you have access to? Um, are you an animator? Uh, do you have a lot of photos of a particular thing or access to a lot of a particular thing? Um, what things are unique to your artwork? Um, yeah, so yeah, I think in a lot of these specific examples, there are people who are um, like sort of professionals in a particular area and are bringing uh, machine learning and sort of integrating the two of them. Yeah, and I'll just add that I think, um, you know, I'm already seeing that happen in just some of the stuff that people are posting in Slack, right? So um, Matt is taking some of his 3D work and like finding ways to manipulate things using machine learning. I know Dylan is taking her own photography and, uh, and like bringing them into the models. So um, yeah, I think this is again, like to sort of reiterate what we talked about last week, which is like, machine learning as like its own like standalone creativity thing is like a world that exists, but like maybe not the thing that I'm most interested in seeing how y'all approach with. Like I'm really interested in seeing everyone bring their own 
interests and their own like own artistic works and bring it into machine learning to use like to extend or like to build additional like materials for your own work. So. Cool. And that brings us on to um, vector input with spell again. Um, here we'll go over like what, like how to actually use um, that vector input. Yeah, so if I can just jump in real quick and just say like, uh, yeah. I don't know, I assume like everyone sort of play with some models. Um, so what we're going to do today is just go over a couple specialized sort of input types. Um, so I know last week we looked a lot at like text inputs and image inputs. Um, this week we're going to look at sort of like some specialized models and talk a little bit about what the inputs mean because they might be a little confusing if you've never played with them before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, vector input um, is a little like non-intuitive at first. Um, so um, what vector in runway you'll, if uh, a model receives vector input, you'll get this like two by two grid. Um, what that two by two grid actually is supposed to represent is this thing called latent space. Um, most machine learning models have what's called a latent space. It's sort of just like this, this, uh, this space with many, many dimensions. Um, here we've illustrated two dimensions and each point will correspond to a particular output. So this point, also known as a vector, will correspond and generate this particular image. And different points will generate different images. And one thing that's really nice about the latent space, uh, especially within Stalgian, is that points that are close to each other will generate similar images. So here you can see these images are pretty similar, um, but there's like a little bit of hair missing and some like very slight, slight differences. Um, another nice thing about latent space with Stalgian is that it's smooth and continuous, which means that we can do nice things like uh, smoothly interpolate from this one all the way over to this one, which looks like this. This is the effect that uh, many of you have probably seen with Stalgian stuff. And yeah, here we've illustrated only two dimensions. In Stalgian, there are actually uh, 512 dimensions within the latent space, um, which is pretty hard for like any of us to even conceive of. Uh, but the way Runway visualizes this 512 dimensional space is it projects, is they project it down into this two dimensional grid and do it in a nice way so that like points that are close to each other in the 2D grid are also close to each other in the higher order 512 dimensional space. Um, yeah, and we've recorded a couple of videos to uh, actually go into the details of like how to like work through runway and go through the, the vector input. Um, Derek's recorded this demo on BigGAN. I also recorded one on a particular Stalgian model. Yeah, and so the important thing to know with, um, so BigGAN actually uses 128 dimensions, whereas StyleGAN uses 512. If you're in Runway, you don't know the difference. Um, but what you do sort of see is like, you'll see in this image already, you've got this grid of images. And essentially what it's trying to do is it's trying to like sort of uh, geolocate similar images to each other. So, um, you know, in the center is is one image and you'll see like the one kitty corner bottom right to it is like very similar. Um, so the way this like 2D visualization works, it tries to cluster images of similar types. Um, and the videos will go through some examples of how to like manipulate that. So there's a thing in the runway interface called sampling distance. If you crank that up, um, you'll get like much more variation in your images. Whereas if you make it, move it down, you'll get like a lot of similar images with like very slight changes. Um, there's also a thing called truncation uh, in the style gam model, and that determines um, sort of what I would describe as realness, or like when the truncation level is smaller, uh, you get less uh, image diversity, but you will get more like realistic looking images. Whereas if you crank the truncation level up higher, you will get um, like 
weirder looking images, but like a, a much more diverse set. So um, the two videos that we've linked to here will like go into more detail of how to actually demo them. And um, basically we've, we've set up this class as like, there's time for us to lecture and sort of explain theory. And then there's like these demo videos that you can go and watch at your own pace if you're really interested in digging in more into this, so. Um, any questions about vectors before we move into the other stuff? Cool. I guess I just have one question, Derek. Yeah. Um, is in, in the mutant model, is the inference uh, slider, uh, does that, is that what we're talking about or is that something different? That's something different actually. So that is basically just like noise injected into a model. So a lot of these models use, um, if you're familiar with like uh, processing or using coding like noise or randomness, um, a lot of these models use some sort of noise or randomness to like sort of manipulate things a little bit. So that seed value inside a unit is actually just a, a noise or a randomness. Like it just sort of like, there is a latent space in the way that Munit thinks about things and it does sort of move you around a little bit, but that's, um, it's a little different. Um, yeah. Cool, so I will talk about image segmentation. So uh, next slide, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. um, so I, if you've, in the beginning or last week, we looked at uh, horse to zebras, right? And how do you convert a horse to a zebra? So that is a whole field of image generation called image to image translation. Um, and here are a bunch of examples, right? So you've got uh, on the right hand side here, you've got black and white to color. So how do you, this is something like Deoldify, how do you convert a black and white photo to color? Um, you've got edges to photos, which is like taking edge outlines and making them photorealistic. You've got things like day to night. Um, what we're gonna talk about in image segmentation are sort of these, if you go to the next slide, um, are sort of these models sort of here at the top left. Back one, yep. <laughs> um, so image segmentation is like a bigger category of machine learning. It's something that like many ML people and researchers are really, really into. And you can kind of see why on the top left, right? That is like, a, that is like autonomous vehicles, like self-driving cars type of stuff. But essentially what, what the way this works is that um, some poor does data science intern has to take a bunch of real photos. Um, if you go to the next slide real quick, they take a bunch of real photos and they outline all the shapes. And those shapes are then color coded um, so that in this example, like a blue is clearly cars, red is people, yellow seems to be traffic lights. Um, it looks like there might be like a pinkish color for non-driving like road. There's this purple through the middle that is uh, the road itself. So like basically someone makes a big data set of a bunch of real world images. Um, and let's go to the next slide. Uh, and in this case, it's, it's building facades, right? So someone takes photos of building facades and then like color codes all the different materials. So you've got windows, brick, uh, these sort of, uh, I guess what would be like balconies. Um, so someone goes through and like makes a huge data set of these uh, image labeled maps. You'll hear them called segmentation maps, label maps, um, and then it pairs them directly with um, the photo they represent, right? So you can imagine them, they're almost onion skinned over top of each other. Um, so they are a direct like uh, silhouetting of, of, the, of a real image. Uh, and the next slide. Um, so what they do is in the machine learning model gets trained on the real inputs or the real images, um, the segmentation map, and then it tries to generate um, images, excuse me, it tries to generate images using those two together. Um, and over time through the training process, it gets better and better. Um, so this is a various field that you'll see within machine learning. It is pretty common. Um, as I mentioned, it's big on like uh, self-driving cars, um, computer vision type of material. Um, the next slide, I think. Cool. So then um, how do artists use this? So this is a thing called Spade. Spade is a tool available within Runway. Um, this is a way for us to basically begin to build scenery. So this is, this was trained on a bunch of um, landscapes, right? So like um, someone took landscape photos, generated maps of like, here's what a tree is, here's what sky is, here's mountains, here's water, here's rivers, whatever. Um, and then those get color coded. So each of those is then mapped to um, you know, various experiences. And then there's a way to basically do live inference or testing. So uh, 
the NVIDIA people who generate, who created Spade made a UI that allows you to like draw stuff and you see it almost real time um, edited. You can edit scenes. So now this is starting to become big in like the gaming world, right? Because if you imagine like some game scenes where you can like, uh, you know, a, a artist can draw some scenery and then you go in and label stuff, you can then generate almost on the fly uh, new scenery. So this is like sort of like we're starting to see this stuff become popular with autonomous vehicles and then also gaming. Um, if you go to the next slide. So inside Runway, there are uh, a number of models that do um, segmentation to image. Uh, so basically you provide it the color maps, the silhouettes, and then it generates images from that. So um, on the left here is labels, uh, is the labels to facades. So that is a model called Pix to Pix. Um, Pix to Pix is sort of an older model now. It was big two or three years ago and has now sort of been um, usurped by Spade. On the right are a number of Spade models. So each Spade model is trained on a different data set, right? So we saw the landscapes one, which is the one on the far right, um, as the example in those GIFs before, which is like generating um, different landscapes. There are two others in Runway. There is one called Spade Coco. Um, anytime you see anything labeled Coco, uh, Coco is a data set um, and it is a bunch of objects. The data set is literally called Coco Stuff. Um, so it is a bunch of just like bottles, um, you know, whatever. So uh, there's this, so that's that model. And then there's another one called Spade Face, which is literally segmentations for faces. So you'll see in that, in that like sort of uh, thumbnail there, you've got like the red is the main face, that brownish gray is like a nose, the green is, you know, lips, that sort of thing. Um, so there's a bunch of different models you could play with inside of Runway. Um, if you go to the next slide for me, Leah. So there's also models inside Runway that do the reverse, right? So one of the nice things about making a data set like this is you can train it what we call A to B, which it would be like, uh, you know, converting maps to images. But you could also train it the reverse, which is B to A, which would be take an image and try to produce a map from it. Um, so there are three, I think, at least uh, image segmentation uh, models in here. There's one for face parsing. There's one for, and there's two called Deep Lab. And the difference between those is um, pretty small. Like they're basically just trained on different data sets. So the, the one on the right is trained on Coco. The one in the middle is trained on MobileNet, which means it's a little bit faster for like, um, like mobile computing, that sort of thing. Um, now you would think, if you go to the next slide, uh, you would think you, you can just like match these two up, right? So you could like take a face and then like a real photographic face and then run it through a face parser, link that to spade face, and then like you could almost go like full circle, right? Have a, have a continuous circle. Unfortunately, um, except for this particular model, the other ones don't match up, meaning their maps, their label map colors are not the same, um, which is just part of, the fact that Runway is grabbing from pre-trained models, like most people weren't thinking about making those connections perfectly. So unfortunately, the only one that really works this way is the face parsing system. Uh, the face parser will give you the same color maps you expect for spade face. Um, so just be aware of that. Like you would think like, oh, I could do some cool chaining stuff. We'll look at chaining next week because um, I do think it's a cool opportunity. And it, it's sort of what that Janelle Shane video was, the Star Wars video. Um, so look at that next week. Um, but in the case of these image segmentation models, they're not like as easy as you would think it would be. Um, so I think for the next slide, cool, yeah. So there's, a, I have a spade demo. Um, Runway has an interface that also allows you to like draw stuff directly inside of um, the UI. So there's this like brush kit where you can draw, you can see my terrible cat and my terrible uh, stop sign that I drew. Um, you can draw directly inside of Runway. I personally don't recommend it because the brush tool is like a little like slow. It's a little, it's a little chunky. It's just like, it doesn't work as, as smoothly as you would want. What we're going to look at next week is actually um, integrating this with Photoshop. So in Photoshop, you can go ahead and draw a bunch of these segments and you've got all the Photoshop tools to make some really cool stuff. You can then send your image map to Runway and Runway will then send you back the real image. So we'll look at how to do that next week. Um, but I think there's some cool opportunities here but I really just want to touch on image segmentation because I think it's like a sort of a special uh, input type that you are probably like uh, intuitively makes sense, but there's some like little gotchas you have to keep in mind. Um, one thing to also note is in this video, there's a way to download the color mapping values 
um, from this spade cocoa model. So if you want to know the exact RGB model uh, variab variables that they use, so like CCC000 maps to cat, um, you can download the CSV from that and, and get access to that. Um, that is really important because if you are slightly off in your color values, um, it will not work. Uh, so these models are, again, are very, very like, again, if we think about narrow AI and how they have to learn like very specific things, um, these are very tightly uh, aligned to what they expect to see on the other side. So make sure that like uh, your color maps do uh, match up. So in this video, um, all that is explained as well as just sort of like seeing a quick demo of how uh, the Coco stuff data set works. Any questions about image segmentation? Go for it, David. Uh, I tried a pixel pix HD model like a couple of months ago, uh, but I don't know if there is any way of putting it inside a runway or what is the difference between uh, the spade uh, way of creating images and pix to pix because I, I trained it in, in Colab, mm -hmm. but I did like a lot of work just to transform a video frames to this type of image with the exact color uh, to try to make a video uh, with the results of uh, pix to pix HD. Yeah. So, I, uh, I remember like searching in the in the paper the uh, pix to pix uh, HD model, and everyone asked about what is the interface to create this type of image uh, like drawn by by hand, and they basically said we are not going to release it. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if there is any other way of doing that or forcing a, I don't know maybe P five or something to to directly <coughs> yeah so um yeah so i think you could use p5 you could use if you bring um your model into runway which i think is a video i think um samir has asked for something like a demo of how to do that as well so there is a way to bring your models into runway um i will admit it is not as easy of a process as i would like um but i can record a video on how to do that um in the next week or two and i'll share that with folks um yeah, this is sort of the challenge is like a lot of these, uh, like that demo that like the, the sort of landscape painting thing that I showed you from NVIDIA, they released some version of that, but it's like definitely very limited compared to what they were showing before. Um, there's also, and I actually recommend like checking out, there is a website for the entire like spade interface, um, which I'll, I'll link to in our notes um, that goes through, there's even more stuff available within spade that like Runway doesn't have access to. So there's a thing called, um, I forget exactly what they describe it, but basically you can provide a, a, um, an image, like let's say you're doing this landscape painting thing. You can provide a source image and it will map from the source image to uh, your, your outputs. So like there's some really, really cool stuff in there. They have an example of it on their website and it is a little clunky. Um, but yeah, this is sort of like the thing of like a lot of these machine learning models, the, they're research projects and they are not like, uh, you know, fully fledged uh, tools that like you and I could use very easily. Um, I think that's changing. And I think, you know, Runway is one of those examples of how they're trying to make it slightly easier for folks. Um, but yeah, we can also like, I'm happy to talk about like, you know, with your particular project, like how to, how to work with it a little bit uh, more cool. um, in the future. So yeah. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Cool. Okay. Let's um, actually, should we take a break? seems like a good time to take a break. All right, cool. So why don't we do, um, I think we're going to wrap up a little bit early. So why don't we do like a, well, let's just do five minutes. Let's just keep it simple. And then we've got time for questions. So um, if everyone wants to come back at 13 after, um, we'll see you in a couple minutes. Like this thing of like 50 slides for one topic. Um, cool. All right, so batch export. Um, so there's a couple different places to find batch export. So batch export, by that I mean, like once you play with a model a little bit um, and you learn how it works, you might wanna say like, put a video through the thing or just like give it 500 images and have it produce a bunch of stuff back. Uh, doing that through Runway, just like with an, one image at a time is gonna be really expensive. Um, so Runway has a batch export option and there's two places to find it. One is inside your workspace um, there is this little export button. It's kind of hidden, um, but basically you click that and you'll get the exports. Um, the other place is in the model uh, information page. Um, there is usually at the top here, there's something like export images and video. That will also pull up the export page. 
Um, that is something that looks like this. So each of these will be slightly different depending on what model you're using. So this happens to be, I believe, style GAN, maybe big GAN. Um, so in this case, uh, the, the models that do vector inputs, um, so again, to go back to vector versus image input, segmentation map, those sort of things, the models that do um, vector inputs will have like a generate images and a generate latent walk video. And that latent walk is uh, what Leah described, which is like going from point to point to point. Um, the options below that will be like a little bit more dependent on exactly what the model does. So, you know, style GAN will probably look like this. Uh, big GAN will also have an option for categories. Um, almost always I recommend you play with these models inside of a workspace before trying to do a batch export, right? Because if you don't really understand what the different options do, you might not really be able to batch export things. So definitely play with stuff in the, uh, in the workspace before jumping into batch export. Um, this is an example of what an image input, uh, like big bigan, um, this is what that sort of interface looks like. Um, so those give you like a big place to import uh, either folders of images or videos or uh, single images. Don't really do, I don't really recommend doing single images through export, obviously, because it's just kind of a waste of your time. Um, but this is an option for uh, importing like large batches of images. So you could import thousands of images and have it run through them. Um, with each of those, you then get the option of sort of like, do I want a single image to be output to a single image or do I want all of the images in my folders to be output to video? Um, so let's say you have 500 images and you just want like a really fast uh, video process. You can do that. One thing, one thing to note is that the, um, the like video process, how it picks frames is always a little confusing to me. So my recommendation might be that if you want to like have a very specific frame order and you're not uploading a video. So if you upload a video to this interface, it'll just like pull, it'll like redo the video back. So like, that's fine. But if you have like an image sequence, um, I might recommend outputting them to images and then bringing them into like After Effects or some other animation program to actually get the sequence right. Um, in my experience, it's been a little funky. It like pulls things alphabetically in a weird way or like the, new, the numbers have to be like in a perfect order. It can be a little confusing. So just be aware of that. But you can output directly to a video if you want. Um, and that works, it works pretty well and it saves you a lot of time. So uh, just be aware of that. Um, each of these, uh, usually when you pick uh, down here, I guess, um, there is an estimated cost. These, the cost for these is much lower than you get just for using runway in the workspace. So um, in many cases, it's, I think it's usually around like one cent per image. So whereas um, runway's workspace is five cents per minute, um, you can't really like produce that many images that quickly. Um, so the cost is lower here. But one thing to also note is that the costs are generally estimates. So like in the case of something like the style transfer model, my style transfer model, if you're gonna try to do a batch, batch export like through that, because those things take longer um, than usual, than a usual runway model, the cost estimate might be lower than it actually is. So just be aware of those things. I find that it's usually pretty, pretty like close to what you would expect. Um, but just be careful because you don't want to like it says the it says it'll be an, a dollar and then it ends up being ten. Um, so maybe try like a small sample before you like go and do do five hundred images all at once. Um, there are limits to in this case. There's like a number of images to generate. There is a minimum limit. I think the minimum limit. And I've got some videos that record like how to go through this. But I think the minimum number of images you can export from a vector input model is fifty, um, and the max is five thousand. I generally don't expect anyone to go sift through 5,000 images, but uh, if you want to, you can. Um, but just know there is a minimum limit as well. So uh, 50, I think, ends up being 50 cents. So like, you know, just be aware of, of those costs. Um, yeah, so there are two videos here um, that I've demoed. So there is a batch export with vector input. So I just sort of walk through like the different vector input outputs um, with a batch export. So how to generate a bunch of images and then how to generate uh, videos. Um, and the videos are latent walks. Um, the problem with those is that you don't really have control over them. So actually, let's go back here. Uh, oh, I don't, know an, I don't know an example of this. Let me just, I'm going to just pull up runway and we'll look there. Come on. So many computer problems today. Cool, y'all see runway, right? All right, good. 
Um, let's go into, uh, let's go to this one. So um, one thing to know with this latent walk is um, there's a thing called keyframes here. These keyframes are random. You do not get to pick them. So next week, we're going to look at how to use P5.js to actually have more control over these like images and like the, the placements and animations you use. So this is sort of random. Um, that can make it a little bit frustrating because sometimes you like be like, oh, I had a really cool idea for like going from this point to this point to this point. Uh, and in runway, it's totally randomness. So um, just be aware of that. So maybe play with like one or two of these videos. But if you want to get really fine game control, you might have to do uh, the stuff we're going to talk about next week. Um, Okay, I just did all that just to show that one screen. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, so just be aware that like there are some uh, quirks of using batch exports. All right, so um, we are done. We're done a little bit earlier this week. Um, so I'm happy to take questions or if anyone wants to demo anything, we can walk through some of the demos. Um, so assignments, so for homework, uh, just keep exploring models. Um, one thing that Leah and I have been do doing over the past two weeks is we've actually generated a playlist of uh, model videos, and we're going to keep adding to that over the next couple weeks. So if there's a model that you have played with inside Runway and you're just not sure how it works, like let Leah or I know, and we're happy to record another demo of just like how we would approach it, that sort of thing. Um, so there's a whole playlist of this. We're going to keep adding to it over time. Um, so I found some funky models that I feel like I haven't really seen anywhere else inside Runway that I think are going to be fun to play with. So I'll probably record some more videos around those. Um, also, uh, you have the opportunity to schedule a 20 to 30 minute one-on-one -on -one with either me or Leah. Looks like I need to add my link to my Calendly. Um, both of these just go to Calendly. So uh, you can just sign up at any time. Our availability is, is made available. Um, you can sign up between like now and like, I don't know, maybe a month after class. So basically what we'd like is I know everyone's busy or people have different schedules. So if you don't get to work on this like over the next couple weeks, but want to come back to it, um, you can always, uh, like just sort of play with stuff and then schedule a time to, to, to work with us later or talk, walk us through things. Um, for the one-on-ones, I generally recommend that you uh, come with questions. Uh, we can hang out for 20 minutes, that's totally fine, but I generally find that when people have a project in mind or like are working on something um, and they come with questions, it's much more beneficial for everyone. Um, but yeah, so feel free to schedule those whenever, like there's really no expiration date on that one-on-one -on -one session. Um, but I do also find that like the further out from class you get that you schedule them, the, the less likely you are to schedule it. So even if you want to schedule it like next week or this week, um, and then just keep putting it off, you're more than welcome to do that. Um, but yeah, I definitely recommend taking advantage of this if you have more like questions devoted specifically to your, to your project. And I'll also say the session that we did yesterday with folks um, was really cool and a lot of fun. So if people are interested in um, doing more of that, like uh, let us know. Um, we're going to try to keep doing it Saturdays. Um, but if that time doesn't work for you, like let, let us know and we're happy to like try to figure out another way to like work with you directly. Um, but I, there were a lot of great questions and um, it helped Lee and I sort of figure out like how we can be recording more videos and more stuff for people um, to put on, on our YouTube page, which helps you and then it helps other people who are watching those videos as well. Um, oh, assignment two. So uh, Matt asked about training. So again, like we're not really going to cover training in this class for a couple of reasons. One is because it ends up being really expensive and also just like you have to have a creator plan with Runway. It just it becomes a whole thing. Also because personally I find like everyone finds built making data sets to be like a very lengthy process. So Leah and I are actually teaching a class in September that is all about making data sets. Um, so if you're interested in that, let us know. Um, but basically like we'll be doing a whole series of lectures on how to make data sets. Um, but if you are interested in generating, uh, doing training inside of Runway, we do have, I've got two videos from previous classes where I did go into that. So this one here is all about building data sets. Um, it's just a, it's like an hour and a half long class. Um, but I cover a bunch of different things and link, link out to other things from there. So if you're interested in that, that's there. Um, and then there is a full class just on like walking through, like doing training of, of a style again model inside of Runway. Um, so uh, check those out if you're interested. Uh, you're always welcome to ask Lear and I questions about those materials. Um, we just won't really be covering them in this class because it's a pretty short class and we really wanted this to be about like learning about how machine learning works and less about sort of doing some of the training stuff, which can be pretty daunting to be honest. So yeah. 
Cool. So with that, um, we're done with class early. Does anyone want us to demo anything? Other questions, other things they want to talk about? Hi, Derek. Hey there. Can you uh, link your collab notebook situation? Um, is it similar to a Jupyter notebook? It is, yeah. It's exactly it's a, exactly like a Jupyter notebook. The only difference is that um, it runs on a on on the web, which is awesome, and it also um, it is uh, it's free because you're using a, a Google GPU, which is really nice. Um, mm -hmm. So actually, here I'm gonna share my screen again and just sort of because uh, I always am promoting many of the things that Lee and I make every week. Um, we have an ML art. Collab. There we go. Um, there is, and we'll link to this. Um, there is a link of just like a bunch of of collab notebooks that either I've made or I've found on the internet um, that cover a variety of things. So, for example, like um, some of these things don't exist inside a runway. Um, so, Deep Dream exists inside a runway, but it's kind of crappy. Um, so, if you're interested in really playing with Deep Dream, which we haven't really discussed in this class, it's kind of fallen out of favor. Um, but if you are interested in this, there's like a really interesting Deep Dream notebook by the person who created Deep Dream. Um, you can open any of these inside of Colab. There are some videos that we already have uh, on YouTube that we can find and link to if you're interested in learning how to play with uh, Colab. Next, next month, we will also be doing a Colab class. So um, I think we've got one space left for that. Um, that was like a really popular request from us. So we're going to do that. We're going to teach that um, next month. Um, yeah. So. Uh, if you're interested, let us know, um, but also we'll link to any of the materials we currently have. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This, sorry. Sorry. Oh. Um, I was just going to ask, is this mostly like Python based or JavaScript? Uh, yeah, almost all these are Python based. Um, Colab runs entirely on Python. Um, there are some like, I know there's, um, there's ml5.js, which is by the P5 folks. Um, yeah. The problem with that is it's very limited in what you can actually achieve, right? So a lot of these uh, machine learning models require like really high powered GPUs and you just won't get that through a web page. Um, so a lot of times the, the, the JavaScript based stuff is like very limited in terms of what you can achieve. But what is nice about Colab is it is free um, and you can use a GPU that, that Google owns or hosts for a couple hours uh, before like they kick you off. So um, you can do a lot of work Doing training inside a collab is like a, a complicated task. I've got some videos on how to do it if you're really interested, um, but I wouldn't recommend it for starters. Um, but if you just want to play with sort of some of the inference or testing of these models, um, there's lots of cool things you can do with just what's listed here. Leah, were you going to say something? I uh, was just saying that that repo is really nice, and a lot of the collab notebooks in it are just like pretty straightforward and easy to run. Like, yeah. you just like read the cell and then press enter and yeah. Yeah, so, you know, we're gonna flesh that out even more over the next couple weeks because of this class like that we're teaching. Um, I'll be adding some notebooks that I have that are like half, very half-assed, like I use them, but they need documentation. So I'll be adding some of those as well um, over the next couple weeks. So um, yeah, so keep an eye, like one of the nice things about our classes is like because we put all of our videos up online after a while, like, you don't have to take the class to like be able to benefit from those materials. Um, so, you know, uh, we're all very happy that you're here in this class and don't expect everyone to pay for every single one of our classes, but the materials still exist and you're always welcome to use our Slack channel to ask us questions or, you know, you can DM me or Leah and just be like, Hey, I've like, I'm trying to learn a little bit more collab. Do you have better links to things? That sort of thing. So, um, yeah, this is like the intro class and like, some of you will get really excited and want to keep learning and others of you will be like, that was enough for me. I understand it. That's cool. Um, so if you are like, want to keep learning, like you're always welcome to reach out to us and like, we'll keep linking stuff. Um, Cause we have a lot of materials from our, from various classes. Like I was even thinking about this before this class started where it's like, I've done this particular version of this class probably like five or six times now. And every class it's different because of like new models or just like me wanting to cover new materials. So like even older versions of this particular class, have different things in them. Um, so it's always worthwhile to like check out and sort of like uh, see what else is on there if you're really interested and have some time to dig through some videos. So 